What's the biggest challenge to believing or to continuing to believe? It may depend a little bit on the person, what your greatest challenge is. And for some, it might be, oh, I've discovered new ideas, or I've run into new arguments against the truth of the Christian faith, or I have encountered this great difficulty, or I've met people from other religions, and I'm having a hard time sorting out which of those religions is true. But for a good many people, one of the hardest things and one of the most difficult things in coming to faith or maintaining faith is this. What Christians are like. How Christians behave. One of the most disheartening things for a church leader is how many church people behave. And one of the hardest things about maintaining faith is the conduct of Christians that you happen to know, or churchgoers that you happen to know. One of the hardest things as a parent is seeing a child head off in a different direction. One of the hardest things is to work with people um, week after week, year after year, and to see almost no difference in their lives. If you consider the state of American Christianity in general, very often the behavior of those who are involved in churches isn't really significantly different from that of others. And so that begs the question, is all of this real? Even if you can make a good case at an intellectual level and bring out good arguments and good evidence, does Jesus really make a difference in anybody's life? If you look at children even who grow up in good, apparently healthy Christian families, and they yet are... They seem to be messed up. They seem to be walking a different road. And you think, what in the world does it make any difference to believe in God? Sometimes you wonder, is there a God? Because if there is, shouldn't there be a bigger difference in those who claim to know Him? That's kind of the practical side of the more theological questions that Paul's dealing with in Romans chapter 6. Because he's explained in Romans what a wonderful thing it is that God brings forgiveness, what a fantastic thing it is to have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, to be in Christ instead of in Adam. But then some people say, well, yeah, but doesn't that mean then that we can just go on sinning that grace may abound? And so it seems like there are some people who don't even want it to make much difference in their lives that Jesus Christ has come. They want their lives to go on pretty much as usual and then get off the hook in the end. So after Paul has said, hey, where sin abounded, grace abounded all the more, um, then comes this question, well, should we go on sinning so that grace may increase? And his short answer is by no means. And then he gives a little longer answer and, and speaks of dying with Christ and rising with him and of the meaning of baptism. We were buried with him through baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. In answer to the um, matter I raised a moment ago, um, how, do, how do we know Christianity is real if it doesn't seem to make much difference in people's lives? Um, there's quick intellectual answers to that and say, well, you can't judge Jesus by what some of his followers do and by their failings. Or you might trot out the old bumper sticker, Christians aren't perfect, just forgiven, you know, some, that sort of thing. Um, but that doesn't quite cut it, does it? Because there needs to be reality. And the apostle says, Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, and that same power that raised him from the dead is at, a, at work in real Christians, raising them to new life. And so if there isn't new life, then we have every right to wonder what has gone wrong. And then after explaining the meaning of baptism and that we die with Christ to an old way, we come to life with Christ into new life, he says the first command really in the whole book of Romans, count yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Think of yourself in a particular way. This is a 
This is one of the most important statements that we can gain here in the book of Romans, is to realize that we have to view ourselves in a new light and think of ourselves in a new manner. I mentioned in preaching on this before that it's a bit like a child who started out life in a really miserable, nasty home situation and then um, was taken away from those abusive, evil parents and brought into a home of very loving and kind, adoptive parents. It's still pretty hard to shift mindsets and realize I'm in a brand new situation. I have new parents who love me now. I have new opportunities that I never had before. And now I need to, I need to count myself to be in that new situation and that child of those new parents and start living that way. Or a person who has been um, released from prison. You can't go around thinking like a prisoner anymore. You can't be intimidated by a bully prison guard whom you happen to meet out on the street or in a restaurant um, who has no power over you anymore because you're in a brand new situation. He's not in charge of you. Or think of having a job, and it is a miserable job. And one of the most miserable things about it is your boss. He doesn't like you. He's mean to you. He looks for ways almost to make your life miserable. He's constantly browbeating you, and you just can't stand being in that job, and, and he's got you so beaten down, you wonder whether you're any good at anything anymore. And then, a new job. A new boss. And it might take you a while to get out of the ruts and, the, and just the thought patterns of having that old boss. You might still wonder and be a little paranoid whether your new boss is out to get you whether one little mistake and he's going to grind you down into the dirt. And you may even have some old work habits, let's admit it, that weren't so great under that old boss. Because when you get down and discouraged and you're in a rotten job, maybe you start doing a rotten job. And you're not putting forth much effort, you're not very enthusiastic about it, and all of a sudden you're in a new company with a new boss where people actually work and do a good job and the companies run well, but you kind of got to get up to speed. Because you're used to being a slacker, because everybody in your, old country, in your old company was kind of a slacker, because that's just the way things were. You need to count yourselves in a new situation and change your mindset because you've got a new boss. And that's a big part of what's being emphasized in the passage we're going to consider today. The fact that we have to think of ourselves differently and then start acting like it because we're under new management. The first part of Romans 6 talks about the new situation that you're brought into through the faith in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ and baptism into him, dying with him and rising with him. And then the last part of Romans chapter 6 talks about the fact that you have a new master. You're slaves to somebody different now. Not slaves to sin, but slaves to God. Therefore, beginning at verse 12, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer the parts of your body to sin as instruments of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer the parts of your body to him as instruments of righteousness. For sin shall not be your master because you are not under law but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we're not under law but under grace? By no means. Don't you know? Again, there's that phrase, don't you know? That when you offer yourselves to someone to obey him as slaves, you are the slaves of the one you obey, whether you're slaves to sin, which leads to death, or to obedience, which leads to righteousness. I put this in human terms because you are weak in your natural selves. Just as you used to offer the parts of your body in slavery to impurity and to ever-increasing wickedness, so now offer them in slavery to righteousness leading to holiness. When you were slaves to sin, you were free from the control of righteousness. What benefit did you reap at that time from the things you're now ashamed of? Those things result in death. But now that you've been set free from sin and have become slaves to God... The benefit you reap leads to holiness, and the result is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. This ends the reading of God's Word, and God always blesses His Word to those who listen. 
Offer yourselves to God. The apostle has said, consider yourselves dead to sin, alive to God in Christ Jesus. That's how you need to think of yourself. And now realize that you are under new management and offer yourselves willingly to the new management, to the new master. The fact is that every one of us is going to be a slave. We're going to be serving somebody. And so we have to make a conscious decision about whom we're serving. Faith involves believing and embracing that God saves, but faith also involves commitment. Or another word that's often used for it, conversion. Conversion means changing from one thing to another. Repentance is very closely associated with that. To the old Hebrew and Greek words for repent just meant turn. You know, you turn from one thing toward another or from one master to another. You convert from one boss to a new boss. You convert from one kind of thing to a different kind of thing. Sometimes you can convert a building from one kind of use to a different kind of use. But conversion is changing. And so a big part of conversion is simply consciously embracing that change, committing yourself, all of yourself, to that change. And that involves a negative side, the turning away from or the rejection of or the dying to, and conversion involves a positive side, turning towards something and somebody and committing to somebody. And so the apostle says very clearly here what that involves. Don't let sin reign. Don't let the old boss run your new life. That's one of the great tragedies that occurs among us Christians. When we come under new management and we act like the old still has the right to run our lives. We still act like we're the prisoner even though we're on the outside. We still act like that vicious old boss has the right to run, the, run our lives and call the shots instead of living for the new boss. And so the apostle says, don't let sin reign and don't offer the parts of your body to sin. Don't offer your mouth to gossip and lying and backbiting. Don't offer your eyes to lust and to greed. Don't offer your hands to violence and cruelty. Don't offer your sexual parts to immorality, but rather to purity. And you could go through every part of the body. Don't offer your ears to listening to the wrong kinds of teaching or to evil music. Uh, don't offer the parts of your body for this bad stuff. Instead, offer every part of your body. Sometimes it might be even wise to pray that way. Lord, I offer you my brain. Help me to think your thoughts. Help me to study your truths. I offer you my eyes. Keep them directed toward good and godly things. I offer you my lips. Let me speak words that build up, not words that tear down. Words that honor your name, not swear words or filthy language. I offer you my hands to build others up, not to steal or to grab, but to work hard and to be able to help others who are in need and to just pray, in a sense, over your whole body a part at a time where you're consciously dedicating and offering your body not to sin but to God. And there's a sense in which this um, can be a one-time conversion or a commitment where you decisively say, Lord, I am yours. Take every part of me. I yield my whole self to you. And there's another element where this can be a daily thing, where every morning you get up in the morning and you say, I've got to remind myself, I am dead to sin. I am alive to God in Christ Jesus. Lord, you're my boss. This other stuff, sin is not my boss. I yield the parts of my body to you for your service today. And as I've mentioned before, it is very important to talk to God about this, to yield yourself to God, and it's important to just talk to yourself. Talk to God in prayer, and as you're meditating on these things, keep on considering yourself dead to sin. Keep on thinking of yourself as alive to God in Christ Jesus. Keep on saying, I've been seated with Christ in the heavenly realms, and it is so important that your mind be in tune with God's truth here. 
Because otherwise, you're going to find yourself just out of old habits agreeing with Satan. You're going to be making agreements with him and saying, well, I don't think God is going to look out for me today and I am going to have to look out for myself. I don't think God and his way is going to be very satisfying today, but I know some other ways to get some quick satisfaction. And your mind will just slip back into old deadly habits. And that's why it's so important that you don't just stumble into each new day on whatever momentum or whatever you happen to feel like in terms of your urges. Start your day with the Lord. Start your day again offering yourself to God. If you want to understand a little bit of why many Christians are the way they are, they go through life almost without thinking and almost without deciding. They just go with whatever the momentum is. And let's face it, the flesh and our very bodies have a lot of habits just kind of ingrained in them that unless you make decisions, unless you consciously turn from sin to God, sin is going to reign in your mortal body. It just is. And so you need to believe by faith every day that you are in Christ, that you are risen with Him, and you need to dedicate yourself afresh to God every day to listen to His Word and then to speak to Him and give yourself a good talking to every day. Um, not in the sense that you can just kind of talk yourself into new things, but as I said before, you're not telling yourself false things. You're reminding yourself of true things. The reason you have to talk yourself is not because you're lying to yourself and trying to psych yourself into something that isn't true. Instead, you're talking to yourself because you need to keep telling yourself the truth. Otherwise, just old lies will keep playing their old track. And in these, all these matters, Satan will be talking to you. And he will talk to you as the occasion um, best suits him. If you are unconverted at all or you're living far from the Lord... Satan will say, do whatever you please. Uh, you know, you're your own boss. Have some fun. Do what you feel like. And don't worry what anybody else thinks. Don't worry what God thinks. And so you follow his advice. And you do that for a while. But then you find out and you begin to take seriously the things of God and the truth of God and even the law of God. And then Satan has a word for that too. You no good, rotten, miserable scumbag. Look at what you did. He doesn't remind you that he's the one that wanted you to do that. But he will blast you with all kinds of guilt and just get you to wallow in misery. And sometimes wallowing in misery, you say, well, I've already blown it this bad. I might as well just keep on blowing it. I mean, it's not real rational, but I know that that's a way that some of us can think. You say, well, I, I'm, I'm already so messed up, I really can't mess up much more. Uh, this is just the way I am. So he gets you... So down on yourself, and then you discover the wonders of salvation in Christ, or you are fresh at peace with God, and then Satan will say, Ah, grace, grace, marvelous grace. Isn't it great to feel peace in your heart? Um, let us go on sinning that grace may abound. Uh, forgiving people is God's job, so let God do his job and you do yours. And, and then if you do um, live wickedly, then all of a sudden he'll swing back to that accusation again. And so you always find yourself either under the condemnation of the law or trying to live just apart from God's commands, but he never wants you to actually live as though somebody new is running your life and as though a new power, the resurrection power of Jesus Christ, has taken over your life. He just wants you to keep on either giving it your no effort at all or giving it your own best effort but never actually knowing who you are in Christ or living out of the power that comes from Christ. But the apostle says, now you've got to count yourselves dead to sin, alive to God in Christ Jesus, because you are. If I say to, one of my, if I say to my teenage kid who wants me to do everything for them or isn't being very responsible, I say, you're not a baby anymore. Now, am I lying? No, they're not a baby anymore. Don't act like a baby. Now, if I say that to my little granddaughter, little baby Anna, you don't act like a baby. You're five months old. Don't act like a baby. Well, you know, that's not the kind of speech you ought to give to a little baby. Of course, she might just smile because she wouldn't understand anyway. But the point is, 
if somebody actually isn't a baby and you remind them of that fact, you're just reminding them of the truth about themselves and say, don't act so immature anymore. You're a little, you should be doing better than that now. You're, you're grown up, act like it. And, and so it is here. You're in Christ. You have the Holy Spirit in you. You have a new standing in Christ. Now start acting like it. Offer yourselves to God and don't offer yourselves to sin. Sin shall not be your master because you're not under law but under grace. That's a key statement. Sin shall not be your master. Sin has no right to rule over you. And it's not accomplished by the fact that you get a whole new dose of the law being commanded to you but instead that there is a new power, the power of grace ruling over you. Now again, that's the whole um, question that comes up again and again in the chapter. Does grace promote sin? The chapter um, begins, you know, right after the end of chapter 5, where sin increased, grace increased all the more. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. And then this statement, you're not under law, you're under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we're not under law but under grace? By no means. May Genoita, the same, same deal. God forbid. No way. Never. So the apostle is struggling against this notion that grace promotes sin. And at the same time, he will not go back to just law and say, now you start by be, being forgiven by grace and then you just use law to keep on going. He says, you're not under law. But that doesn't mean that you're going to be sinning all the worse because you're not under law, because now you're under grace. You're under God's reign of grace, and God's rule is at work in your life, and that's why you're not going to keep wallowing in sin. Now, when we think of God's law, I just want to highlight what it means not to be under law. And before I mention that, I just want to mention four lies about God's law. The first lie about law is legalism. And legalism says that God's law is a ladder to God, and you do good deeds to earn salvation. And you got to chalk up points with God, and if you chalk up enough points by keeping the law, then you make it, otherwise you don't. And that um, legalism is a deadly lie. Those, the Bible says if righteousness could be gained by the law, Christ died for nothing. So legalism is, is a terrible lie, and it's one that the apostle opposes. But there's an opposite error, um, very long word, antinomianism. Anti means against, nomos means law. Antinomianism just means against lawism. You know, law is bad. Ignore it. Do whatever you wish. Sin will increase grace. God likes forgiving. It's his job. Give him something to forgive. So um, antinomianism is a great error that's existed throughout the history of the church um, in various forms that says God's commands don't matter because, hey, it's all grace, um, keep on sinning. And then a couple more uh, lies. One is ritualism, um, focusing all on the ceremonies that were given in Old Testament law. You still have people today who look at the ceremonies of this or that feast or this or that ceremony, and, and they want to keep doing those things as though they're essential to salvation when, in fact, they were signs pointing to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so you can get a form of ritualism that focuses on various ceremonies or rituals and not on Jesus Christ and his salvation, not on the Holy Spirit, not on the life of love, but just on certain particular actions that you do in a ceremonial manner. And then there's a fourth lie, which um, I'm not going to get into much today, but it is a misuse of Old Testament law and of uh, the law of the Scriptures in general, which says, well, your nation and in particular, the United States, if you happen to live there, your nation is God's unique people. And therefore, the government of your nation should force all people to act like Christians. Now, the churches may not um, have any form of church discipline or any kind of uh, guidance to uh, help people live according to the Lord, but the nation itself should make everybody behave as Christians. The memo is the United States is not the chosen people of God. God has purposes for the United States, but the United States is not the light on a shining hill, as some have said, even some of our presidents have. That is the Church of Jesus Christ, not the United States of America. Do not confuse the two. And, of course, what gets enforced is uh, you can't really expect unredeemed, unsaved people to act as though they were born again 
and are controlled by the Holy Spirit. So these are four errors about law, and two especially the apostles dealing with in Romans. Legalism, and he's saying um, righteousness comes not through the law, but through faith in Christ. And at the same time, he says, if you think the law is bad, you better think again, because the law is holy and righteous and good and has important purposes in God's plan. So having seen that, what does it mean that we're not under law? Well, four things it does mean. It means that we are declared righteous apart from law. We're right with God through faith in Jesus, who kept God's law perfectly on our behalf. So, we're not under law when it comes to our status from God. That righteousness from God comes apart from law, and it comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. That's the point that Paul makes in Romans 3 and in many other places. A second thing that it means not to be under law. It means that you're free from the law's covenant curses. In the law, especially in Deuteronomy 28 through 30 and so on, it speaks of the curses that come on lawbreakers and the blessings that come to law keepers. Well, once you're in the category of lawbreaker, it's pretty grim. And if you read that list of curses, it's nasty. And the fact that Jesus suffered the curse, as it's written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. He suffered the curse of the law and canceled our debt. That means that we can again be brought into covenant with God and have all those curses against us taken away. We're not under law in the sense of being under its curses anymore because Christ has taken the curse for us. A third thing that being not under law means is that we're empowered to live new life by the Spirit and not by the law. And under the new covenant, God's Holy Spirit writes His law on our hearts and gives us knowledge of God's will, but also the power and desire to do it. And the desire and ability to do the law do not come from the law itself. When we hear God's law in an unredeemed state, we hate it. Or we just rebel against it. Or it makes us want to do the opposite. But when we have the Holy Spirit living within, writing the law in our hearts, then we're not under the law as the law being the key to make our lives better. Because it can't. It can't save us and bring us forgiveness, but it also cannot transform us in and of itself. We're not under law in the sense of depending on it to change who we are or how we live. And a fourth thing about not being under law is that the old covenant signs give way to the new covenant reality of Christ. So, those are some of the things that it means to say we are not under law, and instead we're under grace. But to not be under law doesn't mean that law therefore is bad, or that God's commands and His holy will revealed to us are bad things. It just means that we're not under those things in the sense that we need them to be made right with God, or that we're under the curse of them, or that we're counting on them to make us better, or that we still need the old rituals. We're not under law in that sense, but we still listen to God's law because through the power of the Holy Spirit, we can begin to live according to His truth and according to His guidance. And it all comes down to this, says the Apostle. You're not under law and under grace. And if grace, and if God's grace, and the God of grace is your master, then what you going to do? And you got to answer this question, who's your master? Don't you know that when you offer yourselves to someone to obey him as slaves, you are slaves to the one whom you obey, whether you're slaves to sin, which leads to death, or to obedience, which leads to righteousness. Jesus himself put it this way, everyone who goes on sinning is a slave to sin. I mentioned at the beginning how disheartening it can be um, to find sin in other people's lives and wonder whether the gospel makes any difference. It's very disheartening to find sin in your own life and wonder whether the gospel is making a difference. And it is important to be honest and to examine ourselves because it just might mean not that the gospel isn't true, but that I don't have new life. We do have to consider that possibility. I'm not saying that it's so every time you discover sin in your life or every time you're battling sin, but you do have to examine yourself and say, well, now that I look at it and take a good hard look at it, who's running my life? Who's in charge? And if you say, well, it's not God, then my only answer would be, if God's not in charge of your life, don't imagine that he is still 
your Savior. If Jesus is not your master, it means this. You're a slave to sin, which leads to death. That's the upshot of the apostle's argument here. And the, the Bible talks about this on many different occasions. The book of Jude speaks of godless men who change the grace of God into a license for immorality and deny Jesus Christ our only Savior and Lord. So if you're just using grace as an excuse to do your thing, it means you're a godless person, according to Jude. Or to take James, faith without deeds is dead. Demons, he says, believe that God exists, and at least they're smart enough to tremble about it. The Apostle Peter says the same thing. They promise them freedom while they themselves are slaves of depravity, for a man is a slave to whatever has mastered him. And the Apostle John, if we claim to have fellowship with him, yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not live by the truth. So we do have to examine ourselves very closely. If we reach the conclusion, God is not running my life. He is not my boss. Somebody or something else is my boss then you have to realize that those whom God saves, he rules. And the flip side is, those whom God does not rule, he has not saved. Now that's not meaning that you're saved by good works, but just get these two sentences in mind. We don't get salvation through works, but... When we are saved, we do good works. Um, you don't do good works in order because you don't, you're not saved because you do good works. You do good works because you're saved. Okay, maybe that's the best way to put it. You don't do good works in order to be saved. You do good works because you're saved. And if you don't, then you just have to say, well, do I have fake faith? Now, that doesn't mean, again, that everybody who is struggling against sin is therefore lost. And every time you fall into another sin, you should say, well, I've lost my salvation all over again. It does mean that if the predominant tone of your life is that I'm being run by some power besides God, I have to ask whether he has saved me at all. And if there is an alien power, but I also know God's power is at work within me, then I'm going to call on God's power to help me fight that enemy power of sin that has no right to be running the show in my life. And I have to be very careful when I've been saved to not go back into sin and say, boy, I wish that I could be back in the good old days where I could do what I wanted and had so much fun. There's an example of that that we find in the Bible. You read the book of Exodus. We're talking about slavery today. The supreme example of slavery was the people of Israel under Pharaoh in Egypt, under his taskmasters and their whips. And the Pharaoh was very cruel. He had these taskmasters forcing the people to labor hard and work hard. They weren't allowed to go and worship God where they wanted. And when they wanted, they were forced to give up their own children. And the children were, the little boys were murdered. That's the kind of slavery that they had under Pharaoh. And they were mistreated, abused for long, long years. And their taskmasters were cruel to them. And then God delivered them. And God sent, uh, sent plagues on their masters. And rescued them from Egypt, and then he brought the people of Israel through the Red Sea on dry ground, and then when the Egyptians tried to go through the sea after them, God closed the Red Sea over them and drowned the armies of Pharaoh, and the people of Israel were free. They were out of Egypt. They were beyond the sea. The armies were dead. Nobody from Egypt had the right to rule over them anymore. Nobody from Egypt had power over them anymore. God had gotten the people out of Egypt. And then he led them on their journey towards the promised land. He led them through the wilderness. And when they got hungry, he sent them manna, bread from heaven to eat. And he nourished them with that manna. God was providing for them. And then one day they got up and they said, If only we had meat to eat. We remember the fish we ate in Egypt at no cost. Also the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, the garlic, now we've lost our appetite. We never see anything but this manna. What? Oh, for the good old days. Free food. Such good food. Oh, man. We ate great in Egypt, and we never had to pay a thing. That's selective memory. 
they didn't have to pay a thing except the lives of their children being destroyed. They never had to pay a thing. They, never had, they could never worship God where they wanted to or when they wanted to. They never had to pay a thing. They got whipped day after day, week after week, year after year, but it was free onions for everybody. <laughs> Woo! And the apostle knows how we tend to think. He says, you know, you've got to think about this. If you want to go back to that old master, if you want your life to be run again by sin, let's think back a little bit what Pharaoh was like. Let's think not just about the onions and the garlic. Let's think just a little bit about the dead babies and the whip slashes on your back. Think about that for a little while. He says, I put this in human terms because you're weak in your natural selves. Just as you used to offer the parts of your body in slavery to impurity, to ever-increasing wickedness, so now offer them in slavery to righteousness leading to holiness. When you were slaves to sin, you were free from the control of righteousness. Well, what kind of freedom is that? You know, each slavery offers its own kind of bondage and its own kind of freedom. Each offers its own kind of progress. He says, if you're under the slavery of sin, it's always increasing its grip on you. It's getting progressively worse. And you're freer and freer from righteousness. You lose more and more of your freedom to do the right thing. And you're more and more enslaved. Sometimes it's the power of an addiction. And at first, you get addicted to it a little bit. But... As it goes on, you need more and more of that drug or more and more of that alcohol to get the same effect. You get addicted to pornography, but after a while, it's not just the same stuff you were looking at. It's got to get nastier. It's got to get worse to have the same effect. You, you get enslaved to greed, and early on, you know, all you wanted was kind of a hot car and a and a few things in your bank account, and you get on in the years, and money, money, you just got to have more of it. It's never enough. You know the old question they asked John D. Rockefeller, how much is enough? His answer was, a little more. And he was already the richest man in the world. But that's what slavery does to you. You got to, you, you go deeper and deeper into it. Ever-increasing wickedness is the impact of slavery to sin, and on the other side of it, when you're living for God, righteousness has its own kind of momentum. Early on, you might only be, be able to take baby steps. And you might almost be discouraged at how little progress you make. Yeah, Satan may even use a sermon like this one to say, well, he said that people um, who are still sinning, you know, probably aren't saved at all. Well, that's not quite what I'm saying. You know, when you start out, you may have... You may have to be taking only baby steps, and you'll be very discouraged at the amount of progress you're making. But don't, if, if you're living for the Lord and you're making progress, take heart in that. Sometimes when Satan says, oh, you blew it, you're back to square one, well, that's not quite true. Let's say you're hike, hiking up a steep mountain path, and you stumble. Well, get up again and keep going. That didn't bring you all the way back down to the bottom of the mountain. So you should not think that every time there's a stumble you're back to square one. So there is righteousness leading to holiness, and it's, and it's a progressive thing. Just as sin progresses and gets more and more of a grip on you, so when God's grace takes over your life, more and more you grow in your ability to serve the Lord. But each of these has its momentum, and beware of that, because don't think that you're going to just stay the same. You don't. You grow in grace, or you grow in sin, but you're not going to just kind of get um, set at one particular level. There is this ever-increasing impact. And the apostle says, don't just think about the impact of, of how it's either messing up your life or making your life a more righteous one, but also think in the long term. He says, think back, what benefit did you reap at that time from the things you're now ashamed of? And think clearly, remember what the, what the Israelites thought once they were out of Egypt, what did they remember? The free food. Well, what, benefit, what were some of the other benefits along with the free food? Well, the slashing on the back, the dying of, of being mistreated in slavery, the killing of your children, 
the lack of opportunity to worship God and all that other stuff. So you've got, before you start getting the turnaround party to go back to Egypt, remember what Egypt was like. What benefit did you reap at that time from the things you're now ashamed of? Those things result in death. If you were addicted to drugs, if you were addicted to pornography, if you were addicted to greed, if you were addicted to being a jerk who says whatever comes to your mind and losing your temper all the time, was that a lot of fun? How'd that work out for you? It ruined relationship after relationship. So think back to what sin does for you. It just results in death. It results in the death of relationships. It results in eternal death if you would stayed on that path. But now that you've been set free from sin and have become slaves to God, the benefit you reap leads to holiness. That's benefit number one. You're already being changed right now. You're becoming more and more like the Lord Jesus. Don't you want that? If he's living in you, if he's running your life, that is a tremendous benefit to see that you're at least inching bit by bit towards becoming more like the one who loved you and gave his life for you and took over your life. So the benefit you reap leads to holiness. And the result, eternal life, reigning with Christ, having your whole life set free from every kind of illness and disease and everything that is wrong, living with him forever, enjoying the fellowship of angels, enjoying the fellowship with all believers who've gone before you. Think about the benefits. So the apostle is asking us to think, think, think. Think about who you are and who you're not. Think about who's living in you and who has no right to govern you anymore. Think about what you're becoming, whether more righteous or more holy. And think about, am I on the path to eternal destruction and death? Or am I on that path that results in eternal life? And then he sums it all up. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. If you say, well, who's my boss? And who do I want to be my boss? Well, then consider, what's the wages of the one boss? He pays out at the end of the day, death. That's what you get at the end of your pay period. Death and hell. And what does God pay? Well, he doesn't pay a wage. There's a big difference there. He doesn't pay the wage that you've earned. He gives the gift. That's the kind of master he is. He gives the free gift of eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So, in short, just compare the two slaveries. You're going to be a slave of somebody. Bob Dylan was right. It may be the devil or it may be the Lord, but you've got to serve somebody. So you're going to serve somebody and you're not going to be your own boss. That's, that's point number one. You're going to serve somebody. So given that fact, who you want to serve? Well, slavery to one master means freedom from the other. You're going to be free from righteousness and free from God if you want sin to be your master. And if you want God to be your master, and if he is your master through faith in Christ, well then, you're free from sin, and the only reason it has any power you, over you anymore is that you let it. You believe lies that Satan tells you, but it's not true. You don't have to act like a baby anymore. You don't have to act like a prisoner anymore. You don't have to be the employee of the old boss anymore with all the bad habits you picked up there. You're under new management. You're a new person. So remember that, and be free of the one master, and live for the other one. Then realize that each slavery keeps changing us. Are you being changed more and more into the likeness of Jesus or not? Each slavery leads to a final destiny. The wages of sin is death. The gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Slaves to God, what a tremendous blessing that is. Slaves to sin, what a horrid curse. And we've been set free from that curse by faith in Jesus Christ. Just every morning you get up, Wake up and say, God, I'm yours. And then give yourself a speech. Self, I'm God's. Talk to him, talk to yourself, and then get out there and offer your bodies as servants to him and the parts of your body as slaves of righteousness. Dear Father, we pray that you'll help us in our daily life to reflect the eternal realities that have become true of us in Christ. Help us, Lord, to believe these truths and to build our lives upon them, not to build our lives on the lies that Satan tells about us. He'd love, Lord, to ruin our witness, to ruin our joy, even after we've been saved, to spoil the good work that you're doing in us. But we pray that we will refuse and reject him 
and more and more live in newness of life through the power of the Holy Spirit, through the resurrection life of Christ, and under the wonderful rule of our great Master. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.